Good. Dear mate, thank you so much for the invitation. And yes, while Sirina was talking, uh, we were evacuated from our building because there's a construction site, there's a gas leak, so I had to cross half the campus and finding a quiet place. But but here I am safe. So thanks. Um, on behalf of the public health and the epidemiology interest group, I really like to thank Diabetes India for the opportunities to to be here with you today and to have this space for our interest group a seminar or webinar and on four different topics that are related um, that each of us of the leadership is is working on and especially also a lot of thanks for Amit for all his work within our leadership team of ADA. So my talk is going to be about physical activity in the prevention of type 2 diabetes. Um, this is a picture of the campus, how it looks like um, in if, when it doesn't rain. So I'd like to go through four different contents. First of all, very briefly about type 2 diabetes prevalence and risk factors. Then to talk about what do we know of cohort studies in regard to the effect of physical activity in preventing diabetes mellitus. Then we're going to talk briefly about the effect of physical activity in prevention of diabetes uh, results of clinical trials. And in the end, like how we can implement scientific research into the practice which means the translation or research element. I think we all know that, or we know that the estimate numbers of the International Diabetes Federation that shows like the prevalence of diabetes in the age group 20 to 79 years old, this is published more or less a year ago. And we see, especially India, also have a high prevalence of diabetes in all the Americas. It's over 9% in some um, parts of the world, we have over 12% diabetes prevalence. So. As diabetes is very difficult to treat, we should probably put a lot of attention focus on how to prevent it. We also know a lot about the preventable modifiable type 2 diabetes risk factors. On the top, usually it's obesity, central obesity, physical inactivity, and sitting time. And my talk will be mainly focused on the physical activity aspects and physical activity and partly sitting time, but also combining like the aerobic and strength training and its impact on the prevention of type 2 diabetes. But we know a lot of modifiable risk factors and we should probably work interdisciplinary targeting most of them. So what do we know? Uh, the evidence of cohort studies in, on the effect of physical in prevention of type 2 diabetes. Basically, it's not that new. We had evidence already many, many years ago. This is a study from the um, Harvard alumni study published in, in New England Journal of Medicine in 1991 that followed up like Harvard alumni according to their baseline physical activity. So they had like sports played. Some people had non-moderate only vigorous, only moderate and vigorous. They also had another variable flights of stairs climbed and blocks walked per day. So they followed up these um, alumni and they realized that the relative risk for those who are moderately active at baseline to get type 2 diabetes was reduced by 10%. Those with vigorous physical activity was reduced by 31%. And those who had moderate and vigorous physical activity in leisure time, they had a reduction of future diabetes by 35%. And we see there, there was apparently a tendency like a dose response. When they had a look at the flights claimed, they didn't find statistically significant differences. However, it seems to be that if you climb 5 to 14 or more than 15, uh, the stairs per day that you have a, a reduction of diabetes by 25%. Blocks walked was not associated, but what the study also showed is that for 500 kilocalorie of energy expenditure increase, the incidence of diabetes decreased by 6%. And this was known already 30 years ago. And this provided probably first time some baseline information of what's happening. Then there are a couple of uh, systematic reviews and meta-analysis on the relative risk of type 2 diabetes in people moderate intensity physical activity and this is one published uh, already more 15 years ago that showed like in in total a 17 percent risk reduction of type 2 diabetes among those who have moderate intensity physical activity and these are population studies they also revealed uh, another systematic review by Grunvet about uh, 12 years ago, that weight training uh, is also associated with incidence of type 2 diabetes. We can see here on the left side 
they chose the relative risk of type 2 diabetes according to weight training in minutes per week. The interesting thing is, and the important thing is, that already with 60 minutes or 30 minutes of weight training per week, you have almost a 20% reduction of risk of future type 2 diabetes. And if you add like uh, minutes to it, like probably after 120 minutes, we seem to reach a threshold. The additional benefits are probably not that high, but I think for public health purpose, it's important to know even with 30 minutes or 40 minutes of weight training per week, we can have already substantial benefits. What they also did, they analyzed like combination of aerobic exercise with strength training. And they basically revealed, we can see here on the, on the right-hand side, the, the black dot is those who did not have any weight training, did not meet the recommended uh, recommendation for aerobic exercise, which used to be 150 minutes per week. Then we have those here on the left-hand side who do not in general meet the recommendations, but do weight training. So even with one to 59 minutes per week, you, they had already a reduction of 20% of diabetes. And those who practice or reach the aerobic recommendations, weight training apparently gives some additional benefits in regard to future risk of type 2 diabetes. So this is important for people who maybe are not able to do aerobic exercise, they can do at weight training, and that may be also relieve some benefits. Another uh, review meta-analysis published seven years ago revealed, uh, uh, evaluated total physical activity and risk of type 2 diabetes, and there basically showed that the overall risk reduction of type 2 diabetes was 35% um, if people were, were active. So again, pretty solid the evidence. You can see here, the blue doxus, there's not that much heterogeneity. All studies basically revealed the same direction of the association and combined a 35% reduction. That particular study also analyzed several components of physical activity. So we have here in the box A in the upper left corner, they showed leisure time visited in type 2 diabetes, a linear dose response analysis per 20 met hours, so metabolic equivalence hours per week, about a 20% risk reduction. Then they also show met hours per week uh, in, in general in, in panel B, that similar than strength training, we have large benefits already for small amounts of met hours per week. And then more or less for more hours, it probably levels off. And um, the similar pattern seen in, in D of leisure time facility per hours a week. One or two hours already per week, we can have, we can see large benefits. <laughs> they also analyzed the intensity of physicality. So we could see vigorous physicality in type 2 diabetes, high versus low analysis in, in panel A. So a 40% almost risk reduction dose who have vigorous physical activity compared to those who do not have, even low physical activity compared with those who have no physical activity seem to be of benefit for um, future type 2 diabetes. Then we can see that moderate physical activity had a risk reduction of almost 30%, and even walking, which is an easy form of physical activity, revealed more or less a 20% the risk reduction of future type 2 diabetes. And as you can see, the scientific evidence in Rio Accords that is pretty solid. As we know from research designs, experimental study, they offer a bit more um, evidence of causal association. And there were several studies have been conducted on several randomized clinical trials in people pre-diabetes to see whether we can decrease the, the onset or prevent or delay the onset of type 2 diabetes. So the very first study was to finish the diabetes prevention study that included about over 500 persons with impact glucose tolerance, middle-aged adults with a BMI at 25. They were randomly assigned to two groups, a control group and an intervention group. And the intervention group consisted of uh, reaching 30 minutes of physical activity per day combined with weight loss. What you can see in the slide is like the people free of type 2 diabetes in the follow-up. And we can see already after one year, there started to be a difference between the intervention control group. At two or three years, at three years, the difference was basically the relative uh, risk was a reduction of 58%. Interesting, the study population or the participants were followed up afterwards for more years, 
and that difference remained even that after the intervention stopped. Changes in cardiometabolic profile in the participants were uh, remarkable. So we see uh, naturally a weight loss, waist circumference decrease much more in the intervention group than the control group. Uh, fasting glucose values, two hour glucose values decreased more. We had an improvement of ATHL cholesterol, a decrease in triglycerides and systolic and diastolic blood pressure. So all these interventions had an impact, a large impact in the cardiometabolic risk factor profile that also leads not only to decrease in the risk of diabetes, but other cardiometabolic diseases. You, you know, from the um, DPP, the Diabetes Prevention Program, that had um, similar results, they published the results about one or two months later. They had it, an additional group, the metformin group, and again, the lifestyle intervention group was mainly physical interventions and, and weight control. But you can see the life intervention group did much better than the metformin group that consists of 850 grams, milligrams per metformin every day. When they analyzed specifically like the change in physical activity, naturally there was a large improvement of the physical activity, the metabolic equivalence per hours per week in the life intervention group as it consisted of the physical activity intervention. And metformin doesn't improve physical activity unless you probably put the tablet on the 10th floor and you have to climb up the stairs to get it and coming down. But basically, lifestyle was probably worked much better due to that fact that it inclu included an active component. We also know from the Dajing study in China that, that analyzed that the very similar interventions that uh, consisted of physical duty and other components of weight control, and they analyzed their study according to a uh, different intervention group, diet only, exercise only, and diet and exercise combined. And they analyzed uh, separately lean uh, participants and obese participants. You can see on the left-hand side, the control group that had the highest incidence per 100 person years of diabetes, and the highest had the obese in the control group. So they did not have diet or exercise. We can see all three intervention groups that work. They decreased the incidence of type 2 diabetes. Naturally, the decrease was bigger in lean individuals compared to obese individuals. But even if you're obese and start with exercise, you're going to have a benefit and reduce almost by half or by almost 70% the type, incidence of type 2 diabetes. And this is important when we talk with, with people. Sometimes we have people that are obese, overweight, and they say they think that they don't benefit from from lifestyle changes or exercise because they're obese. But evidence shows that even if you're obese and overweight, you're gonna benefit. Naturally, you need to be careful how to prescribe physical activity. In summary, we can see that the evidence from randomized controlled trials is consistently showed that type two diabetes can be delayed or um, prevented by lifestyle intervention. We can see here a lot of studies separately analyzed exercise, and relative risk reduction varied uh, remarkably up to 46% of relative risk reduction in people who engaged in physical activity. Also, I'd like to point out a lot of studies that combined physical activity with diet uh, interventions, and we'll talk a little bit more later on that. There's also a study that combined like the effect size of physical activity interventions and in HbA1c in people without diabetes, and they consistently show like improvements of uh, HbA1c in percentages up to 0 0.25 uh, units decrease of HbA1c in people who are physically active. And yeah, in general, there are summaries of short-term interventions in populations with prediabetes, a screen detected prediabetes followed by intervention. Uh, and if they're short six to two months, the impact of the risk reduction of type 2 diabetes was about 31%. For longer interventions like three to six years, scientific evidence have showed that the relative risk reduction is about 37% of future type 2 diabetes. So we have the information and we know that from cohort studies and from randomized control that physical duty can delay or prevent type 2 diabetes. Now the question usually is, and this is the last part of my presentation, <clears throat> how the population can benefit. And this is where pro probably translation and research come into actions, how to drive existing intervention clinical practice guidelines 
how to implement the guidelines, and then how to evaluate the impact of implementation of the guidelines. The ADA guidelines includes um, evidence on physical duty and life interventions on the prevention or delay of diabetes in people with pre-diabetes. But there, had, there was a delay of almost 10 years getting into the guidelines. I'm not sure, I don't know the Indian guidelines. I hope that, that you have some elements of this already included and I'm convinced you have. So what did we do in, in Europe and South America in this intervention? First of all, we developed uh, a European study, the DE plan, and the uh, main leader was my mentor, Jakob Duomilechta, who most of you probably know. And when implemented the project, we had about 20 centers in 18 different countries in, in the European Union. In each of these countries, implemented the TPS. So interventions of exercise, weight control in people with pre-diabetes in primary healthcare. So these were not any more scientific studies for how to implement interventions we know that work in real life in primary health care. I can assure you the results of one center, uh, the, the center in Catalonia and Barcelona. They, in primary health care, they had almost 600 patients for that were evaluated. And they showed that both individual interventions and group interventions on increasing physical activity and nutritional habits decreased the incidence of type 2 diabetes. The individual interventions are more effective than the group interventions um, however, both interventions work. And when they had a long term and they followed up the patients for up to four years, they realized even after one and a half years or two years, already there was a large difference and cumulative probability of remaining diabetes free between the intervention and the control group. So they basically showed that it works as well in a real life population. So, in a concept of a pragmatic trial, naturally the impacts usually less in real life than in, in clinical controlled settings. What we did next, then we brought the project to Barranquilla, to Colombia in the north of South America. And we screen detected people and we included people, um, but initially 500 people in the three different groups, a control group, nutrition intervention group, physical activity group. Mm -hmm. The nutrition group had first six months of nutritional interventions followed by physical activity interventions so adding the component the physical activity group had first started physical activity and then the nutrition element was added after six months what we basically realized in that study is that we didn't find differences between the control group and the interventions group into our glucose levels or fasting glucose the problem was that all groups improved even the control group reduced the two hour glucose values by 20 milligram per deciliter and the reason probably was there was a high contamination of the intervention because some members, family members, they were split. One was in the control group, the other intervention group. So it was a contamination of the interventions. There also may be some effects like the heart internal effect or a lot of diabetes related activities in that city at that time. However, we think that we showed that we can implement the works. We can detect people, screen for people at high risk of diabetes and provide life interventions in a primary healthcare setting, even a country that is very different than European countries, um, such like uh, lower or middle income country. The CDC had the second ever national diabetes prevention program. It has now probably over 1,600 centers and programs in all 50 states. More than 10,000 coaches have been trained in providing interventions serves probably nowadays almost 200,000 participants and a lot of healthcare plans, insurances have included this into their coverages. So patients receive uh, uh, reimbursement if they participate in the program because they realize it's cheaper to prevent than to treat. The first ever national diabetes program is the one in Finland, the DECO program is also implemented um, in the whole country, but it's different probably implementing program 5 million people, such as Finland, on a population of over 200 million. And I think I can only imagine the challenge you have in India for with one, 1 billion people implementing diabetes prevention. There's evidence on diabetes prevention in the real world. So having a look at the weight changes and impact so they basically revealed that weight changes, um, I think this is a percentage of more than 2.3% combined, which I think has a big public health impact. To conclude, um, 
people at type at risk of type two diabetes that should receive counseling how to reach the recommended levels of physical activity. Probably a combination of aerobic and strength exercise will be most beneficial. And it also means health personnel who manage people at risk of type two diabetes. They should have adequate training skills to advise their patients about physical activity levels and how to prescribe physical activity and have a follow up where they reach the levels and what the barriers are. Finally, the Cochrane Library um, published their evidence-based recommendations that first stating that diet, physical activity, um, that there's no firm evidence that diet alone or physical activity alone compared to standard treatment decrease the risk of type 2 diabetes. So, however, these two elements combined, diet plus physical activity reduces or delays the instance of type 2 diabetes in people with impaired glucose tolerance. And everything is about energy balance. So that's why it's probably changes in physical activity should be combined with changes in nutritional habits and caloric intake. Uh, Thank you very much for your um, present, uh, for your invitation. And I'm more than happy to answer questions.